الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المذنومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأعرض عمن تولى عن ذكرنا ولم يرد إلا الحياة الدنيا صلاة الله The verse of Quran that I have just uh, recited before you is from Surah Al-Najm, chapter 53 of the Quran, verse 29, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَأَعْرِضْ عَمَّنْ تَوَلَّى عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا So turn yourselves away from those who turn away from our remembrance. وَلَمْ يُرِدْ إِلَّا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا And you will find that these are people who want nothing but the life of this world. This ayat of Quran draws for us a contrast between those who constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who seek the world and that these two are um, cannot both be had at the same time. And so inshallah this afternoon with the barakah of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad I want to reflect on this verse and talk a little bit about the dangers of what we call hubbud dunya or the love of this world. This is a subject that you hear about very often and uh, the ulama will tell you about the difference between uh, you know, the good world and the bad world. <coughs> and the good world being using the world for akhirah. Ad dunya mazra'atul akhirah for example we have in hadith that this dunya is the farmland for the hereafter. Whatever you sow here, you reap there. And therefore, uh, you know, there are instances in Nahjul Balagha, for example, you will see where Amir al Muminin heard someone condemning the world and cursing the world and saying, Dunya is this and Dunya is that and Dunya is, you know, to be cursed. And he stops him and then delivers a whole khutbah to say, When has the world deceived you? Has the world deceived you or have you deceived yourselves? Has the world not given you enough examples? Have you not seen in your life people who were rich and then became poor? Have you not seen people who were poor and then became rich? Have you not seen people who are young and strong and how they grew old and weak? Have you not seen young people die? Have you not seen old people die? Have you not been to the cemetery and laid people into their graves? Have you not been to the hospitals? Have you not suffered afflictions yourself? Have you not seen the gray hair on your own head and your own beard? So when has the world deceived you? Or is it you who have deceived yourself? So the point here Amir al salam is trying to make to the man is that the world is not bad in and of itself. And in fact it has a very fundamental role to play and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite wanting for us Jannah and wanting for us eternity, He places us in this temporary abode because it has a purpose to serve, which is to help us attain <coughs> Akhirah. But for the most part, dunya is condemned in the Quran. You know, وَمَا الْحَيَاتُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُونْ وَلَعِبُ You will see the Quran saying this very often, that the life of this world is nothing except a game and a sport and a play and a mirage and an illusion and things like that. And that is because wherever it speaks of dunya in that sense, it speaks of materialism. Now, this verse of Quran that I recited for you from Surah Al-Najm, it says, فَأَعْرِضْ عَمَّنْ تَوَلَّى عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا So turn yourself away from whoever you find is not preoccupied with our remembrance. Our remembrance, dhikr of Allah can be in many ways. It can be in words, in speech, in tongue, in prayers, and in Quran, in du'as, but it can also be in action. Somebody who is constantly occupied in his thoughts and his actions with serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Turn yourselves away from people who have nothing to do with Allah, who are not bothered or concerned with Him on their day-to-day -day basis, and they don't remember Allah except a little. And the quality you will find in them is that the reason they don't remember Allah is they are obsessed with dunya. And so then the verse continues, وَلَمْ يُرِدْ إِلَّا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا That these who turn away from our remembrance, they want nothing except this dunya. And then what is interesting is that this verse continues. If you read the next verse, it says, ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ that is the maximum limit of their understanding and their knowledge. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ اِهْتَدَى Indeed, your Lord knows who is truly misguided and He knows who is rightly guided. Now, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you is, and there are other verses that you can match with this to see, that if you look at, for example, Surah Al-Munafiqoon, and it talks about the hypocrites, it says, uh, if you listen to the hypocrites talk about dunya, you will be amazed, you will be mesmerized. They speak with such passion, with such knowledge, with such depth that you will think this is it, this is where I need to be, I am behind. So there is this constant idea that those who turn away from our remembrance and those who want nothing but the life of this world, you will find that because they run after this world and they are obsessed by it, they know a lot about this world and how it works. But that is the maximum limit of their knowledge. You talk to them about business, you talk to them about how the world operates, you talk to them about the stock exchange, you talk to them about you know, politics, current affairs, they are super knowledgeable in these things. But you talk to them anything beyond dunya, they put it aside as this is just fairy tales. There is nothing beyond what we can sense with our uh, sensory um, organs and perception, nothing beyond empirical proof. So there is the whole real world beyond this world which is in Allah's sight simply a dream, simply a passing away cloud, simply an illusion, simply a mirage that they are completely unaware of. The world of angelic beings, the world of demons, the real world, this akhirah, this uh, darul baqa, the abode of permanence, they are completely ignorant of that. ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ and then what is interesting is when that verse continues, it says, your Lord knows who is truly guided and your Lord knows who is misguided. Meaning sometimes you might see an individual who claims to be a Muslim, who seems to be practicing Islam, but their love for this world is so much that in reality they are misguided. It appears to you like they are on the right path. And you might see somebody who is very ordinary and you think he has no knowledge of religion, he's not really a scholar, he hasn't really attained any level in Allah's eyes, but because of his constant dhikr of Allah and turning away and seeing the world for what it is, he is rightly guided. But you miss that. We have in hadith that people would ask the Aima salam that why is dunya called dunya? And in one hadith when someone asked uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib <laughs> He said, Sumyati dunya dunya li annaha adna min kulli shay. Dunya was called dunya. Now in Arabic, adna is something very low, something base. When you say something is higher up, ulya, and then something is lower, it's adna. Dunya is called dunya because there is nothing more adna than dunya. It is the lowest of things in Allah's eyes. And other ahadith say it is called dunya because it is dani. Dani again means something base, something that, you know, in Urdu you might say past, like something very low. You know, we have in Hadith al Qudsi, for example, that says that in Allah's eyes, this world and all it contains has less value than the wing <coughs> of a fly. If Allah gave everything in this world, to someone who has no faith in him, then don't be amazed by it, because it has no value in Allah's eyes. And there is an ayat of Quran that I don't have the reference to right away, but it's very, very interesting. It says, had it not been for those who have faith, would lose faith, we would have given so much to those who are faithless, 
that their homes, the roofs would have been made of silver and gold. And this is not hadith, this is in Quran. <coughs> that we would have given all the good in this world to those who have sold this world for the hereafter. And another verse in Quran as well says that whoever wants this dunya, we will give him dunya. <coughs> and then there is nothing for him in akhirah. But whoever wants akhirah, then you must endure some of the um, lesser um, what is seen as blessings of this world in order to help the soul build to what it needs in order to accomplish akhirah. So Allah gives you just what you need whether it is blessing, whether it is suffering, whether it is opportunities in order not for your body to form but in order for your soul to form because your body will not last for more than 70, 80, 90 years, right? Have you known a lot of people who have crossed the age of 100 and those who have, have you known them to be very productive in life? No. So the body has its own time limit and it will take its toll and no matter how healthy you eat and how much you exercise and all that is good it will eventually deteriorate and collapse. But what will remain from that is the soul. And the example I've given before in other places is that the human body is pregnant with a soul. And when we die, what essentially happens is we give birth to that soul in whatever state it has formed. Now, when a fetus is in the womb, what happens to the fetus in the womb is not important whilst it is in the womb. It is important when it comes out of the womb. So for example, when the fetus is in the womb, its fingers form. But it doesn't need the fingers in the womb. It's going to need it when it comes to this world. The heart forms, the brain forms, the reproductive organs form, the eyes form, the hearing forms. Everything forms in that miracle that is in the womb of the mother. <coughs> But it's in a sack of liquid. It has no use for all that. Even the digestive system, it is not eating through its mouth. It is preparing all that for when it comes here. Now while it is in the womb, if it found out that it's not going to have all its fingers or it's not going to have its eyes, it might think it doesn't matter. I don't need it. But wait for the nine months to pass, then it will realize what it is missing. So the human body in this world is pregnant with a soul and what is important is that that soul should complete its formation so that when it comes out of this body and goes to the hereafter it has all the organs and all the faculties it needs to succeed and live in Jannah. In this world we might say well why do I need Salat and so on? Why do I need to build generosity in myself? Why do I need faith? Why can't I be a miser? Why can't I be materialistic? Why can't I be jealous? What does it matter if I lose anger? Why is it wrong if I commit violence or I commit sins? Because to us sin is something small. It has no physical reality. We think I commit a sin and then I'll do tawbah. Allah will give me life, right? But what we don't realize is that constant sinning is deforming the soul. Now while you are in this world, because the soul is in the body, you don't see the need for the soul to be perfect. So it is seen as something, it doesn't really matter in my day-to-day -day life, because the occupation is with dunya. But once the body collapses and then the soul comes out, and the soul looks at itself and realizes how deformed and ugly it has become, because it failed to purify itself and complete itself, then it realizes it's now disabled for all eternity. And that is why there is that emphasis on Akhira versus Dunya. Now, so we have established that the reason why Islam condemns Dunya and materialism constantly and places its focus on Akhira is because Akhira is Darul Baqa, it is for all eternity. This is a temporary abode. And the purpose of this is only to, it's a fire that you're going through. Just like gold is covered in ore and you have to put it at very high temperatures in order for the slag and the scum to fall off, to become pure gold. You must put yourself through this fire of dunya to purify yourself and come forth ready for akhirah. Now, there is another uh, 
understanding of this which is to say that the downside of being occupied with dunya is that it creates certain qualities in the soul which is greed, hatred um, and selfishness. And occupying oneself with dunya makes one forget akhirah of course. Forgetting akhirah means forgetting dhikr of Allah. And then it means the soul is now stagnant, it has stopped, it is no longer progressing and moving forward um, towards salvation. The reason I want to, you know, I chose to talk about this subject is because this is where there is danger for mu'mineen, for individuals like um, myself uh, and yourself as people who claim to have faith. You see, people lose their soul in two ways. One is through faithlessness, through um, hatred. Like, for example, people who hate Allah, who hate Islam, who hate Quran, who hate Ahlul Bayt. That is one way in which they lose their soul. They become faithless, they become atheistics, they become against, you know, the truth. But there is another way to lose the soul, and that is to have faith, to fast, to pray, to give zakat and homes, to, you know, do everything that is wajib, keep away from haram, but to still have love of this world. <coughs> and what it does is, when there is that love of the world and we don't address it, the addictions in ourselves that we just ignore day after day after day, because at face value it's not haram, it catches us in the last moments of our lives when we are closer to dying because shaitan is constantly trying to ruin us but he maximizes his effort at the time that a person is dying because he knows this is the last opportunity he has and after that once the soul leaves the body with faith there is no way he can get to it so if you think of the human soul as a battleground for forces of good and evil for <coughs> angelic and demonic beings fighting for that soul if you disidentify from yourself as an I and just think of yourself as just a soul that is a battleground for angels and demons fighting for that soul. At every moment as every individual is dying, there is a battle being won or lost. There is a soul that is being taken over by the angels or by the demons. And the idea here is that if we have all the faith and we have Quran and we have Ahlul Bayt and we have all the necessary face value practices of Islam, the one thing that remains a danger for us is this hubbud dunya, which can ruin us at the last moment. The Quran gives us an example of a man at the time of the Prophet Musa salam. His name was Bal'am, Bal'am bin Ba'ura, many of you may have heard of him. And his story is given in Surah Al-A'raf and Allah specifically mentions to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He tells the Prophet, tell them the story of this man. He doesn't mention the name of the man because that is not important. This name Bal'am bin Ba'ura we get from Riwayat and Hadith. But the Prophet said, tell them. And in Surah A'raf uh, verse 175 and then 176. In 175 he says, وَاتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتَيْنَا آيَاتِنَا Tell them the story of that person whom we gave our signs, whom we gave knowledge. This was a man who was given ilm. He became very, very learned. And uh, some say his knowledge reached to such high levels that when he looked at the heavens, he could see the angels. This was the maqam he had. Now, it shouldn't amaze us when he falls because Iblis even had a very high maqam. The moment an individual starts relying on himself and thinking I have attained this because of my own ability, then that is already set up to fall. Where no matter how high we go in life, we must always have this uh, humility to understand that whatever level I'm at, Allah is holding me up there. If it is not for Allah, I cannot be at this level. You know. Some people have misunderstood this. There are some misguided Sufis, for example, who say that when you attain enlightenment, when you attain nirvana, when you attain this breakthrough where your ego collapses, then it doesn't matter whether you pray or you fast. It makes no difference. Why? They say, and they use the Quran. They say, the Quran says, Wa'bud rabbaka hatta yaqeen. 
and worship your Lord until you attain Yaqeen. Now Yaqeen means many things in Arabic. One of the meanings of Yaqeen is death. Maut is also called Yaqeen in Arabic. So, Wa'abud Rabbaka Hatta Ya'atiyakal Yaqeen. Worship your Lord until Yaqeen comes to you. Means worship your Lord until the day you die. But there is another meaning to this, which is worship your Lord until that which you claim as faith with your lips and your mind enters your heart and you attain absolute certainty beyond doubt. You have no need for proof anymore. So they use this verse and say that when you have attained this absolute yaqeen, you have already fulfilled the purpose for which Salat was instituted. Salat was there to give you yaqeen. You've got yaqeen, so you don't need Salat now. But the answer to this that the ulama give is, as you climb towards yaqeen, you climb a ladder. Rung after rung after rung, you go through the different levels of sabr and shukr and tawakkul and so on, and you attain yaqeen. Now when you're at the top of the ladder, if you become arrogant, what you say is, now I'm at the top, I don't need the ladder. So you kick the ladder. When you kick the ladder, you're not going to stay up there, you're going to fall. But if you acknowledge that no matter how high I am, I'm still standing on a support, there is something that is holding me out, then you don't kick that support. Because you realize the moment I stop dhikr of Allah, the moment I stop salat, the moment I stop psalm, the moment I stop humility, I will fall. And this is what was the downfall of Iblis. Now this is the story of Bal'am. He attained such levels that he could see through the heavens. وَاتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتَيْنَهُ آيَاتِنَا فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا But gradually he turned away. He became cynical. His heart became hard. All that hadith, all that... Ayats of Tawrat, all that wisdom and knowledge he loved, he started taking it for granted. It no longer meant anything to him. It no longer had importance. And this is the danger of knowledge. On one hand, Islam says you have to acquire knowledge. Talabul ilm faridatun ala kulli mu'minin wa mu'mina. Seeking knowledge is a duty, an obligation on every mu'min and mu'mina. But the other danger to it is when you acquire knowledge, if you don't practice it, then it makes your heart hard. Why? Because then it doesn't have that precious value to you. Now you need something bigger and stronger. So if I tell you, for example, a very beautiful hadith on ma'rifat of Allah or zuhud or turning away from dunya, and you're completely blown away by it and taken in by it and impressed by it, and you say, I'm going to practice this. <coughs> if we don't practice that, then we listen to it again and again and again and then it becomes normal for us. It no longer has that, you know, awe. It doesn't strike that awe in our mind. Now we need a stronger hadith and another hadith to give us that high, that spiritual high. So the more we gain in knowledge, if we don't practice it, it makes the heart harder. And this is what happened with Bal'am. He began taking his knowledge for granted. It no longer had that appeal to him. And in its place, he began loving dunya. فَأَطْبَعَهُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ The moment shaitan saw that now he is impressed by his knowledge and he wants the prestige and the honor and the name and the fame and the rank, he has hubbud dunya. He started pursuing him. He went after him. فَأَطْبَعَهُ الشَّيْطَانِ Shaitan went hunting for him. So shaitan is looking for prey. He started praying on him and he took him into his control. Now Allah says, if he would not have gone to Hubbud Dunya, if he would not have listened to Shaitan, if he would have stayed, we would have elevated him even higher. This is now the next verse. وَلَوْ شِعْنَا لَرَفَعْنَاهُ And had we wished, we could have elevated him even higher. But what was the problem? The problem was, وَلَكِنَّهُ أَخْلَدَ إِلَى الْعَرْضِ the problem was he kept clinging to the world. He just would not let go of his love for the world. No matter how many signs we gave him, no matter how he struggled for dunya and we frustrated his struggle to turn him towards religion, no matter how much suffering we gave him to, so that perhaps he might turn back to akhirah, he just would not give up his love for the world and clinging to that relentless pursuit for dunya as if he's going to live forever. Now Allah gives his example. 
وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ And he began following his base desires, his hawa, which we talked about uh, um, in previous uh, majalis as well. فَمَثَلُهُ كَمَثَلِ الْكَلْبِ So his example is the example of a dog. Why a dog? Because Allah says a dog is always got his tongue out panting. That is the kind of man he became in his love for the world. In tahmil alayhi yalhath aw tatrukhu yalhath. If you chase the dog and engage him, his tongue is always hanging out, you know, panting. And if you leave him alone, he's also just sitting there, his tongue is panting. Meaning, when you show him dunya, he runs after it. When he can't get dunya, his occupation day and night is just how to get more dunya, how to get more pleasure, how to get more of, you know, material and physical and not the hereafter. ذَلِكَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا This is the example of those who deny our signs. Whom we show our signs, they believe in it and then they deny it. فَقْصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَأَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So tell them this qasas, O Prophet. Tell them this story so that they can reflect on it and say there were those before me who had higher spiritual states. But they fell because of this hubb dunya And there is an antidote to it that I will, you know, a cure to hubb dunya that I will come to uh, very shortly. But I want to give you one more example. You know, in these days of Aza and Muharram, we talk of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad was the commander of chief uh, in, in, in Karbala for the Yazidi forces. And he was the son of a very eminent man. Right? Umar ibn Sa'ad was the son of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas who had uh, conquered lands for Muslims and his father was held as a Sahaba of the Prophet and he was held in very very high rank. Umar ibn Sa'ad was a man who had a mark of sajda on his forehead. That's how much he used to worship Allah. He used to get up in the middle of the night and pray Salatul Layl. He used to, this is someone, you know, told me this once, I haven't read this, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's true. He put some, um, you know, metal studs under his shoes because when he walks, he was afraid he, he should not step on any ants or creatures of Allah. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to make sure he makes noise so the creatures run away so he doesn't harm them. This is Umar ibn Sa'ad, the commander-in-chief who kills the grandson of the Prophet, right? Now, you see, what is different about Umar ibn Sa'ad and why it is so important for us to look at his life is when you look at people like Shimr and uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Hasin bin Namir and Harmala, these were Nasibis. These were people who hated the Ahlul Bayt. They were against the Ahlul Bayt from day one. They had a deep hatred for Amir al-Mu'minin So their presence in Karbala does not surprise us. Umar ibn Sa'ad was different. He didn't come to Karbala because of his hatred for Ahlul Bayt. He came to Karbala because of his love for the world. And that makes it more frightening for us because he is the commander in chief. And you need to ask yourself at some point, what would I do if I was in his place? He had this thing about the land of Ray. He wanted to be the governor of Ray. Ray is what is today called Tehran, okay, in Iran. And it had fertile land and a lot of crops and agriculture and his father had played a role in conquering Iran or Persia. So he had been exposed to that land and geography and he knew what value it had. And Obaidullah ibn Ziyad knew this about him. But he wanted somebody who is held in eminence in the Muslim community to go fight Imam Hussein. So he told Umar ibn Sa'ad, if you go and stop Hussein in Karbala, I will put a good word for you with Yazid and I will make you the governor of Ray. But the condition is you either bring the bay'ah of Hussein or you bring his head to me. One of the two. Now, look at this and you can go read this in uh, Sheikh Mufid's uh, Kitab al-Irshad. He talks about this and there are other books that detail the history of how Umar ibn Sa'd slid. When Ibn Ziyad told Umar ibn Sa'd, I want you to go to Karbala, he didn't go right away. Huh? He asked Ibn Ziyad, he said, can you give me one night to think about it? Just like Hor spent his night thinking 
between Jannat and Nar. Umar ibn Sa'd did the same thing. He asked Ibn Ziyad, give me a night. He spent one night in Kufa just thinking, should I kill Hussein? Should I fight Hussein? Should I not fight Hussein? Should I do this? Should I not do this? And he stayed up all night thinking about this. Now, for you and me, this would be an easy decision. But why is it taking him so long? Because of Hubbud Dunya. And at the end, when the dawn came, he composed some words in poetry, which said, they say there is Jannat, but who has seen Jannah? <coughs> Whereas Ray and the Mulk of Ray is before me, is at hand. So this idea set in his mind that even if I kill Hussein, I can do Tawbah in Istighfar. Right? But Akhirah is far. Who has seen Jannat? Who knows if Jannat is real or not? But Dunya is here. So he comes the next morning and he tells him, okay, I will do it. <coughs> Then when he's getting ready to leave Kufa, he starts asking for advice from people. And Sheikh Mufid narrates several individuals of eminence who come to Umar ibn Sa'd and tell him, don't do this, you're making a mistake. You stand up against the son of Zahra salam, this will weigh heavily against you on the day of judgment. You're making a mistake, you can still back out of this. He still could not give it up because of the love of this world. Now take this a step further. He goes out of Kufa, he's going towards Karbala, he stops halfway, he comes back and tells Ibn Ziyad, I can't do this. I've changed my mind. But now Shaitan has got him, right? So Ibn Ziyad starts telling him, Mulk re, re, think about it. I'm just telling you to go there and keep an eye on Hussein. I'm not telling you to fight him. You see, he leads him gradually. He's not telling him you have to kill him right away. Just go there and just keep an eye. And then I'll send you instructions. Just let me know what's happening. So they can, okay, well, maybe I don't have to kill Hussein and I can still get Ray. So he goes back. Now he arrives on the 3rd of Muharram with 4,000 men. From 3rd Muharram <coughs> until the 8th night of Muharram, Every single night he sat with Imam Hussein face to face having discussions late into the night. He was trying to find a way where he could get Ray but not kill Hussein. And Imam Hussein was explaining to him why I cannot pledge allegiance to Yazid. And Imam Hussein said to him, give up Ray, I will give you a better land than Ray. And when he finally said, I cannot give it up to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein said, I tell you this with the knowledge I have, you will not eat even one seed from Ray. Mm. And that's exactly what happened because when he went back, he got nothing. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad kept, you know, skipping him this way and that way and saying, I'll write to Yazid and I'll tell Yazid and I'll do this and I'll do that. But Yazid himself was in trouble because once Imam as Sajjad and Sayyidah Zainab showed up in oh. Kufa and Sham, his government was now shaking. So he did not have the presence and the mind to even think of people like you know Umar ibn Sa'd and Shimra and they were now just collateral damage they were nothing to him and Imam Hussein told him you will not even eat a seed and he knew that Imam Hussein is not lying but this is what Hubbud Dunya does every night can you imagine if you were sitting with a Masoom Imam third night Muharram fourth night fifth <laughs> night sixth night and there is a documented history of the correspondence between him and Ibn Ziyad. He kept writing letters to Ibn Ziyad with different proposals to solve the conflict. You know what we call conflict resolution, where you bring experts in conflict resolution and they sit between two parties that are at odds and they try and find a solution. He was proposing solutions to Ibn Ziyad. And that is when Ibn Ziyad sent Shimr al Jawshan on the 9th of Muharram with a letter to, Shimr, to, to, to Umar ibn Sa'ad to say, you keep making excuses to me in order not to fight Hussein. I now give you an ultimatum. You either go fight him right away or hand over control to Shimr. He will be the commander of the army because Shimr was next in command. And when he read the letter, this is again documented. Umar ibn Sa'ad said to Shimr, this is your doing. You are the one who plotted and planned this to get power. But by Allah, I will kill Hussein, but I will not let you be the commander. And on the day of Ashura, when Umar ibn Sa'd shot the first arrow, he said to everyone, be a witness. 
I am the one who shot the first arrow at Hussein. Why? Because he wanted everyone to go back and bear witness to Ibn Ziyad that it wasn't Shimr who shot the first arrow, I shot the first arrow. Do you see, my dear brothers and sisters and whoever listens to this, what Hubb dunya does to an individual? He was not a man who hated the Ahlul Bayt. If he hated him, he wouldn't be sitting every night talking to Imam Hussein to find a way to save him. And the Ahlul Bayt knew that. Right? When you read the Masaib of Ashura, and I haven't come to Masaib yet, but when you read the Masaib of Ashura, you always hear that Sayyidah Zainab stood on an elevation that is called Tille Zainabiyya. And at Tille Zainabiyya, she addressed Umar ibn Sa'd. You hear that, isn't it? And what does she say? She says, Yabna Sa'd, will you just stand and watch while my brother is being killed? Why does she address him? Because she knows he is different from the others. He is not Nasibi, but he is held by dunya. And then what happens is that after a person has been taken far enough, he gets to a point where now he says, there is no hope for me. I've already crossed the line. Allah will never forgive me. I might as well go through the whole thing. You've heard of this story of this famous Abid and Alim and Shaitan wanted to misguide him and he sent an old man with his daughter to the Alim and he said to the Alim, you know, my daughter is uh, you know, uh, mentally disabled, um, can you, you know, teach her Quran and then the Alim kept her and Shaitan was planning this and then the Alim was one day, you know, tempted to commit a sin and so he molested the girl who was disabled and then he tried to hide that and then she became pregnant and then he didn't know what to do with that so, you know, he killed her and then he hid her body and then he was finally caught and he was taken to the Qadi and he was sentenced to death and when he was finally on the gallows and the noose one on his neck and shaitan came to him and he said to shaitan this was your doing you led me I was a man of God you brought this woman to me I had to look after her and then you tempted me and then you led me to believe I should kill her and hide the evidence and now I'm here dying shaitan said you know what I can still save you the only thing you need to do now is just bow, do such that to me. He said, I can't, I'm on the gallows. He said, just make your intention that you're worshipping me and just close your eyes, you know, your eyelids as if you're doing such that to me. And the moment he did that, Shaitan said, thank you very much. He was out of there and the man was hung. But he got to this point where he thought, you know what, I have already done so much wrong. I've already, you know, committed... Uh, uh, you know, I've molested an innocent girl, I have killed her, I've hid her body, she, was, she had a child in the womb that I've killed. Now what else is left? I might as well just go with it. And as I've said in my previous lectures, this is what shaitan wants, that point where we lose complete hope. And this is what happened with Omar ibn Sa'd. When he got to the point where now he had done so much, he had killed the Ashab and Ansar and the infant of Hussein and Ali Unil Akbar and Abu al-Fadil Abbas and he had shed so much blood that now, even though Sayyidah Zainab was calling out to him, he was thinking, it's too late for me. I've crossed the point of no return. So this is where shaitan gets us to the end of our lives. And this is where we need to be aware of. And I want to, before I you know, share the antidote and come to Masaib, I want to share a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, Salawatullahi wa salamu He says, whoever loves this dunya, they will be afflicted by three things. And these three things will never leave them. One is, hamun la yafna. They will always have this grief and sorrow about dunya. And no matter how much they drink from this world, they will always be up, upset, angry, grieved that they don't have more. It will never bring them to a point of contentment and tranquility and satisfaction. The second thing will be amalun la yudrikuhu. They will have far-fetched hopes that they will never get to. That tomorrow I'll do this and next year I'll do this and when I'm retired I'll do this and it never ends. And raja'un la yanaluhu. And again this is desires and hopes that which will never be fulfilled and completed. So it is a bottomless pit and it is like sea water. The more you drink from it, the thirstier it makes you. Now, Allah in His mercy has given us a cure to hubbat dunya. 
that after having faith and after having Iman and praying and fasting, you, you will be afflicted by the world because you are physical beings and you live a physical existence. But there is a cure to it, there is an antidote to it. And the antidote to it is the love of Ali Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam. And I don't say this only as a Shia or as an emotional statement, but I say this from a theological and spiritual perspective that it is impossible to find the love of Ahlul Bayt and the love of dunya in one heart at the same time. If it is true love, if it is not just uh, you know, emotional statements, you will never find a person who is deeply, deeply obsessed in love with the Ahlul Bayt and obsessed with dunya. They just don't mix. It is oil and water. You cannot put these two places together. And that is because Allah created them in opposition to materialism and this world. And that is why they are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Prophet said, As I have said before, he is not asking for an ajr, he is giving back. He is giving you the solution to say, this is what you will now need after your faith in order to find salvation. There are so many examples of this. You take the example of Hur that we have given before, right? What was it that saved Hur? And I will come back to mentioning Hur again, you know, as I come to Masaib. But before coming to Masaib, just think about it for a moment. Hur was a commander-in-chief. He had military, he had army, he was paid a salary by Yazid's forces. He was in control. He was on his way to Jahannam. How did Hur become Hur alayhi salam? What saved him was love of Ahlul Bayt. If he didn't have that, it wouldn't have saved him. And, you know, this is why we emphasize Imama and Ahlul Bayt to our children as Shias. Because, you know, the example that I've given time and time again, when you say La ilaha illallah, it takes you out of kufr and shirk and makes you Muslim. It makes you a wahid. When you say Muhammadur Rasulullah, it makes you, brings you into Islam, it makes you a Muslim, from a Muahid, you become a Muslim. But it doesn't save you from Nifaq. Why? Because the Munafiqoon as well, if you read Suratul Munafiqoon, right? The opening verses that says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ the first ayat of Surah Al-Munafiqun, that, O oh Prophet, when the hypocrites come to you, they say to you, Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. They are saying it, the Munafiqun. Wallahu ya'lamu anna kala rasuluhu, wallahu yashhadu anna al-munafiqun ala kadibun. Allah knows that you are his Prophet, but Allah bears witness that they are liars. That means, in the Quran's words, it is possible to say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah and still be a munafiq. Because he is talking about munafiqun and he is saying they say Nashhadu anna kala Rasulullah. So shahada of Rasulullah does not save you from nifaq. The only thing that saves you from nifaq then is the third part that says Wa Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah. Why? Because Allah created Amir al muminin for this purpose, to identify Iman from Nifaq. He says in Nahjul Balagha, I have never lied and I have never been lied to, but my brother, the Prophet of Islam, said to me, O oh Ali, never will a mu'min despise you, even if you cut his nose off with your sword. And never will a munafiq love you, even if you give him gold equal to the mountain of Uhud. It is impossible for a munafiq to love Ali bin Abi Talib. You cannot, he cannot, even if he tries. Allah has placed him in that position. That he is the identifier, he is the litmus test. He is that qasimul jannati wa nar by which you identify. Right? We have a hadith from Salman al-Farisi or Salman al-Muhammadi. And you know the Sunni brothers and sisters have this in their siha sitta as well. That the Sahaba used to say that whenever we wanted to identify a Munafiq, we used to praise Ali bin Abi Talib in their presence. And judging on their reaction, we would know where they stand in Iman and in Nifaq. 
You see, the beautiful thing about this is when Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about himself and the, 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 the hypocrites, he doesn't, he says, I am, he says, Ana ya'asubul mu'mineen. I am the leader of the mu'mineen. Wal malu ya'asubul munafiqun. And wealth or world, dunya, is the leader of the hypocrites. He doesn't put a name to the leader of the hypocrites. He says dunya is their leader. Meaning you can't have Ali bin Abi Talib and dunya. You have to choose between one of the two. And that is why you have all these ahadith that somebody would come to Amir al-Mu'mineen and say, he would stand in front of him in Masjid al-Kufa and say, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I swear by Allah, I love you. And Ali bin Abi Talib would say to him, Are you sure you love me? He would say, Yes, O Ali, my heart overflows with your mahabba, with your love. He said, in that case, be ready for trials and suffering in this world. Wow. Because by Allah, Bala comes running to my Shia like horses galloping down a mountain or a river when the ice melts on the mountain and the river flows down to this world. You were not created for this world to enjoy and to indulge. You were created for Akhirah. This is not your place. You see? Kunu abna al akhirah wala takunu abna al dunya. Mirumin says, Be the children of the hereafter, don't be the children of this world. One man came to Imam al Sadiq, he complained to him. He said, We Shias are suffering so much, people are trying to kill us, we are targeted, we have to hide our faith, we don't get job opportunities, we are this, we are that, and all that. The Imam kept quiet. After he finished talking, then the Imam said, Where are you from? He said, I'm from Kufa, or wherever he was from. He said, tell me, how is the prison in Kufa? He said, it is the most wretched of places, they don't get food, it, uh, you know, uh, there is a stench, they have to relieve themselves there, they have disease, no one looks after them, they are tortured, they are whipped and all. He said, isn't that how most prisons are? He said, yes. He said, didn't my Jad Rasulullah said, ad-dunya sijnun lil mu'min wa jannatun lil kafir. This world is a prison for a mu'min and it is jannat for kafir. He said, yes. He said, then why are you complaining? What do you want from dunya? It is a prison for you. You want good and you try for good to the extent that it helps you succeed in the hereafter. But you're not here to build a legacy and a fortune. For what? And you yourself are leaving in a few decades. I want to end with a story of what the hub of Ali Muhammad does and then inshallah come to uh, words of Masaib. Uh, a long, long time ago, like this is around um, 600 years after Hijrah, so it's well after the Ghaibah of our Imam, but you know, in the early days, there was uh, a lot of people in north of Iraq who are Nasibi, and many of them still are, you know, like during the time of Saddam, you have these places like Tikrit and all these places, and Mosul was one of these places where there used to be a lot of Nasibis, and the governor of Mosul was a man who was a known staunch Nasibi, meaning he hated the Shia and he hated the Ahlul Bayt And him and his wife did not have any children, so they made another. And the another they made is that if Allah blesses us with a child, then we will kill a Shia. We will get this child to kill a Shia. This was the level of their hatred. Now look at how Allah works. He blessed them with a child. <coughs> So they blessed a child, they called this child Jamaluddin. He was known as Jamaluddin al-Musili. <coughs> and he grew up, you know, fine young man, the son of the governor of Mosul and so on. When he reached his early twenties and he was now all, you know, ready and built, his mother said to him, my son, you know, you were born by the barakah of Allah because we made another that if he blesses us with a child, you will kill one of these Rafidis. So now you have to go fulfill our another, go kill one of the Shias. So he thought about it and says, where will I find a Shia to kill? He said, the best way is to get them when they go to Karbala, because they all go for Ziyarah to Karbala. So he came south from Mosul and he sat at a crossroad where the Qafila, the caravans, because in those days they would travel with camels, right, and horses and so on. So he was waiting for a Qafila of Shia to come so he could attack them. He had a dagger. 
The first night nobody showed up. Second night nobody showed up. This is a documented true story. Because this man, when he converted Jamaluddin al Musili, he became an alim amongst the Shia. This is his own story. The third night, as he sat there, he saw a caravan approaching from a distance. He saw a kafila. He said, This must be a group of Shias coming back from Karbala, heading in a different direction. I will get them there. He waited, but the caravan was moving very slowly. And suddenly he was so tired, he felt drowsy, he fell asleep. The kafila came, they passed by him at the fork of the road, and they went on. They moved away. When he woke up, he realized, I missed them. This was my opportunity to kill a Shia. And all that he saw was he was covered in dust, because when the kafila passed, you know, with their horses and all that, ghubar, they were covered, he was covered. So he went back very disappointed that he missed killing them. He slept that night. He says, when I slept at night, I had a dream that it was the day of judgment. It was Yawmul Qiyamah. And somebody announced and said, bring all the Nasibis for the fire of Jahannam. And he says, we were all brought to the fire and I was one of them. And he says, they started throwing all these enemies of Ahlul Bayt in the fire and they took hold of me, the angels. And I was screaming with fear and they threw me in the fire, but the fire threw me back out again. So he says, now he is reporting this. He says, the angels in my dream ask the fire of Jahannam. Ya Naru Jahannam, he is a Nasibi. Why do you not burn him? And the fire says, we cannot burn him because he is now covered with the dust from the Zawar of Hussain. He is now covered with dust from the Zawar of Hussein. Now, he says, now his dream continues. He says, the angels washed me and removed all the dust from my body. And then they threw me back again in the fire and the fire threw me out again. And the angels asked the fire and said, why do you not burn him now? We have removed all the dust of the Zawar of Hussein. And the fire said, but some of the dust has now entered his heart. He has now developed a love for Hussein. And because of that, we cannot touch him. When he woke up, he was a changed man and he realized his parents were wrong. So he converted and became a Shia. He was a poet. He went to Najaf. He studied Islam. He became an Alim. Then he went for Ziyara of Hussein and he composed a couplet which is written on the Dari of Hussein. And these are the words of this Alim, Jamaluddin al Musili, who was born with the intent to kill the Zawar of Hussein. He composed this poetry. He says, and this is on the Dari of Imam al Hussein. Ida shi'atan najat fazur Hussainan. If you want salvation, then go visit Hussein. Likay talqal ilaha qarira aynan. So that you may meet your Lord with that which will delight your eyes. Why? Fa inna nara lan tamasa jisman. For the fire of hell will never touch a body. Alayhi ghubaru zwar al Hussainan. On which is the dust of the Zawar of Hussein. Ida shi'atan najat fazur Hussainan likay talqa al ilaha qarira aynan fa inna al nara lan tamasa jisman alayhi ghubaru zuwar al Hussein. And that is why you're told if someone goes to Karbala comes back try and shake his hand or hug him before he takes a shower even. Because he brings with him a baraka that you don't understand but the fire of hell understands that the angels understand it doesn't matter in this world but it matters in the hereafter and we are told in hadith that no matter how spiritual you become in life if you die without ever going for ziyarat of Hussein this will be one of the sources of your regret on the day of judgment 
unless you don't have the health or the wealth that is a different case for those the Alul Bayt love their Shia so much they will come for your ziyara but if you have the means and the ability at least once in your lifetime you must go see Hussein because the maqam of the Zair of Hussein on the day of judgment is completely different from anyone else it doesn't matter how great an alim he is or what his level and his maqam is and so we want to you know reflect on this for a moment and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed us in this world so that we may develop our souls and succeed in the hereafter but then there was a danger that because we are physical beings we can be taken in by materialism and the cure to this materialism then is he blessed us with the family of the Prophet and said to us that whoever falls in love with this family not only will they guide you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but their love is the antidote to the love of this world that if you learn to appreciate them and what they stand for and truly fall in love with them and serve them in every way you can then they will save you from hubb dunya and they will then in turn repay you for that look at how kareem the ahlul bayt are that we are the ones who need them but they come to us and give us opportunities to come close to them and they say to us that if you come for my ziyara in this world I will come for your ziyara in your grave I will come and help you on the day of judgment when no one is there to help you I will hold your hand and take you to Jannah for those who are not their own family look at how much love they showed you look at someone like Hur Hur came to Imam al Hussein. he tied his hands he put a band on his eyes he threw himself on the feet of Hussein, he said to him, Abba Abdullah, I am the cause of your suffering. I am the cause of your misery. Is there any way I can be forgiven? But Imam al Hussein <laughs> raised him up and hugged him and said to him, Oh, Hur, you are my Mahman. I am ashamed. I do not have water to offer you. And this Hur knew the maqam of Zainab as well. Which is why even when he asked Imam Hussein, have you forgiven me? And Imam al Hussein said, I have forgiven you. He said, can I speak to the daughters of the Prophet? And when he was taken near the Khayyam, and he said to them, I have come to you and I am Hur, the one who is the cause of your suffering. And they said to him, they had forgiven him. Look at the level of love he had for the daughter of the Prophet. When Imam Hussein had, when he had held the reins of Imam Hussein's horse and Imam Hussein had said to him, O Hur Thakalatka Ummuka, O Hur, may your mother weep for you. He had said to Imam Hussein, O Hussein, if your mother was anyone other than Zahra, I would have said the same thing to you. May your mother weep for you. But what can I say when she is the daughter of the Prophet? Because of Ahur's love for Zahra salam, he was saved. He was saved in such a glorious manner that he came to the women at the tent and said, Oh children of Zahra, I will not move until you promise me that you will not complain about me to Zahra on Yawmul Qiyamah. And it was only when Zainab and Umm Kulthum said to him, Go, oh whore, we will not complain to Fatima about you, that he went for jihad. And when he fell, Imam Hussein tied his forehead with the rumal of Zahra salam. Look at how the Ahlul Bayt reward those who show loyalty to them that because of this O oh Hur that you repented at the last moment you will go to your grave with the rumal of Zahra salam ajrukum Allah. if this is the love of the Ahlul Bayt for their Shia can you begin to imagine what the love is amongst themselves what the love of Hussein was for Zainab salam I want to say a few words about Hussein and Zainab salam the Arbab of Azar said that when Zainab was born if she would cry relentlessly they would give her in the hands of Hussein and she would calm down this Zainab who was never separated from her brother Hussein I do not know how she separated from Hussein on the day of Ashura when they walked together for the last time to Imam al-Sajjad and when they parted for the last time and Hussein gave Sakina to Zainab and said my sister Zainab look after my Amana this Zainab salam kept crying for her brother Hussein but she always was concerned for others before her own brother 
when Shimra sat on the chest of Hussein, Zainab stood at till Zainab Bia crying, Oh Umar ibn Saad, will you just stand and watch while they kill my brother Hussein? When she saw the body of her brother Hussein on the hot sands, the next day she threw herself on Hussein and cried, Wa akha, wa Husayna. When she went to Kufa and Sham, she kept looking at the head of Hussein on a spear and thinking, Alas, if only I had brought Kafan with me for my brother Hussein. When Zainab came back to Karbala, she cried for Hussein. But we are told when she went back to Medina, she did not go back home for a long time. She kept looking at the empty chair of Hussein and weeping for her brother Hussein. She would come to the cover of Zahra and cry, Amma, I have returned without Hussein. Miranese says it is as if the voice of Zahra was calling out to her and saying, Zainab, Zainab tera Yusuf mera Shabir kaha hai. Zainab tu luta aai, gharibo ki kamai. Nikli ti to sab kumbe ko aulad ko le kar. Aai hai fakad abide na shahad ko le kar. أجركم على الله على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ذلبوا أي ود قلبي قلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إلهي بحق محمد وأنت المحمود وبحق علي وأنت الأعلى وبحق فاطمة وأنت فاطر السماوات والأرض وبحق الحسن وأنت المحسن وبحق الحسين وأنت قديم الإحسان وبحق تسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسن والحسين يا الله يا الله يا الله Oh Allah, we ask you, Bihaqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, that you accept our gathering here today. Ilahi Bihaqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you to bless us with the ziyarah of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad fi dunya. We ask you to bless us with the shafa'a yawmul qiyah. Ilahi Bihaqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you to give us the true love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad that will save us from hubb al-dunya. Ilahi Bihaqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you for maghfirah of our sins and for shafa'a of those who are ill. We ask you for maghfirah of those who have passed away. And we ask you for ta'jil in the zuhur of our Imam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim. Ma'atami Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain.